operations. Uh, we know back in May 2023, uh, SEUs were notified of the of the identification of the schools in their district per our accountability model, which is Maine's um, model of school supports, as required by USDOE for following statuses. So we had to identify for additional targeted supports and improvement or ATSI or what we call tier one, target supports and improvement, uh, TSI or tier two, and then comprehensive supports and improvement, CSI or what we call tier three. And we utilized 21, 22 assessment data. This was required by the US Department of Education. Um, and also when we notified uh, districts um, last May, we also, uh, indicated that notifications, um, we also um, indicated that there would be another round of, identica of identifications uh, that would be conducted in late fall utilizing 22-23 assessment data. We are working really closely with USDOE and getting our amendment approved um, to our Maine's model school support plan that ensures that our accountability model for school identifications provides additional supports where needed most and meets all statutory requirements. We know that it's December um, and we are still working on that. And so we will provide updated information as it becomes available. Thank you, Monique. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm um, just chiming in here with a, a friendly reminder about the uh, FY23 ESEA performance reports. Um, I know a number of folks have already received approvals on those. If you're not sure uh, whether or not you have at this point, I would strongly recommend that you uh, go into Grants for Me, navigate to your 23 application, and just check it uh, and see what its current status is right now. Um, I know I've been working with a number of districts who are somewhere, um, you know, in, in the workflow of working on edits, you know, something might have been approved by a business manager, but not a superintendent. So um, just make sure you're keeping a pulse on on where you're at with that work. Um, uh, again, if, uh, if you're in a situation where your invoicing is not current as of uh, September 30th of 23, uh, for your FY23 funds, it is going to make it somewhat more difficult um, for you to, to work through your performance report and for us to be able to ultimately approve it. So please make sure that you're continuing to work with your uh, business office counterparts um, and make sure that those uh, invoices are up to date so that they align with your uh, expense reporting for uh, FY23 funds. And then just kind of a final uh, reminder that um, as part of the completion of the FY23 performance report, uh, this year we will also be requiring closeout of your FY21 funds. Um, this is something that you kind of expect moving forward. Um, as we kind of reach the end of uh, the tidings amendment waivers that we've gotten from um, some of our older funding sources. So uh, that final uh, closeout of FY21 funds is essentially done through a final revision to your FY21 application, uh, where you more or less just go into each of your uh, project-based expense reporting pages and just update them with final expenditures um, so that when we look at everything, um, you know, all of your funds ideally should be spent. I know I've I've worked with a couple of folks that, you know, are returning a couple hundred dollars or something like that. That's not a big deal if you fall into that situation, but um, please do make sure that you're, you know, using those funds to the full extent that you can to um, support some programming and um, related expenses for your, your students and your staff. Um, and I'm also gonna throw a, a link in chat real quick. Um, if you're relatively new to your position or you're just maybe curious about um, some tips and tricks for uh, completing the various pages of the performance report, um, we do have some training videos available on our website. Uh, you can access them through the link I just shared in chat. Uh, and of course, if you folks have any questions, do feel free to reach out to your regional program managers. Thank you, Travis. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to give a quick reminder about the 15% rule for the carryover rule for Title I funds. We received another or a waiver from the feds for FY23 funds. Um, so if you take the waiver this year, you can take it, even if you've taken it the previous year or within the last three years, we got a waiver for that requirement. 
but moving forward, you will not be able to take one until three years later. So that would be FY26. So just be wary about how much carryover you have in Title I. Other titles don't have these rules, just Title I. Um, so this doesn't apply if you have a Title I-A allocation of less than 50,000. So if you're a small SAU and don't get that much money, um, and this is all on a page in the performance report that's, that's labeled Title I Part A waiver. Thank you, Jess. So the fall monitoring results are now available. If your SAU was uh, of a medium or high level of support status as identified in your FY24 grant award notification, you were required to submit documentation for this fall monitoring window. We built out that instrument directly in Grants for Me platform. We did require that the feedback we provided, if you had corrective action submissions, that they would be due by November 30th, which we are now well beyond. At this time, some SAUs have now been notified that they still have one or more monitoring item that has not yet been responded to. So as applicable, if you are one of those SAUs, we wanna just give you another reminder that these responses to all outstanding monitoring items within the ESCA monitoring instrument and grants for me um, to get those into us as soon as possible, but no later than December 15th. We are preparing to uh, open our winter monitoring window and with this, um, the way we're doing it now with the three different windows, we need to be able to close one window out in order to be able to open another window. And if we don't get those submissions in uh, at that time, we are going to um, put a hold on access to the ESEA funds for any SAUs until we can get this situation resolved and then be able to move forward with this and then we'll be able to open it back up. But if you need any, if you have any questions, and this is something that's really important, just that open line of communication, or if you need support in navigating this ESCA monitoring instrument, because it is something new, you know, reach out to your regional program manager and come up with a way that you can get the um, necessary items in. It's really challenging for us if we don't hear from you to know what the situation is in order to be able to help you. So we just wanted to give you that one little reminder. Daniel? All right. Yep. Good morning, everybody. Um, just wanted to reach out and let everyone know that um, for SAUs that are interested in forming a consortium for the purpose of being eligible for a Title III allocation for the upcoming year, um, that option will be made available in the FY25 consolidated application. Um, in order to run allocations, uh, preliminaries and final, we will need um, documentation by school board of approval uh, by uh, April 1st. Um, we are working on developing that consortium form. Um, and as soon as we have more information and that form available, we'll make sure we get that out to everybody. But just wanted to make sure that folks were um, aware so they can start kind of talking to other SAUs that you know might be nearby that um, they might be interested in doing something like this. And so we want to make sure that option was available for you. Also in the Title III vein, um, we were audited recently by the U.S. Department of Education, and one thing that they wanted us to make sure that we communicate out to the field was around supplement not supplant for Title III. And so endorsements or certifications that are mandatory um, cannot be funded using Title III Part A funds. So that's going to be um, uh, something that folks need to really watch out for. Um, so anybody who is supplying funds for um, the, the uh, ESOL um, certification, uh, we're not able to use Title III funds for that because that is a mandatory part of Title III. Uh, in the Title III vein as well, uh, we wanted to give an update on the Immigrant Children and Youth um, subgrant under Title III. 
again, as part of the audit by U.S. Department of Education, uh, we need to make sure we're communicating uh, with the field on what the definition of significant increase is in order to be eligible for this subgrant. Um, and I do want to make sure that people note that while this was in the newsletter, um, there has been a correction. And so the definition of significant increase is an SAU that's had an average of more than 10 immigrant students in the prior two school years and has seen at least a 300% increase in immigrant students. Uh, I believe in the newsletter that went out, it was there was a typo that said 200% increase. Uh, so that should be a 300% increase um, in students in order for an SAU to be eligible for this subgrant. Uh, if anybody has any questions on any of these Title III updates, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, my contact information is there and I'm happy to answer any questions folks have. Thank you, Daniel. Good morning, everyone. Um, the first federal fiscal office hour was held uh, last month in November. Unfortunately, I was unable to attend, but I look forward to hearing all about it in today's meeting. Um, these fiscal office hours are for business managers, school administrators that oversee federal programs. Uh, it's where you can go to get your questions answered, any fiscal questions answered. And the main DOE, we strive to have a fiscal representative from all federal grant funds available to you during that time. The next fiscal uh, federal fiscal office hour will be December 28th at 10 a.m. And I've provided a link so that you can go ahead and register for that if you're available. We would also like for feedback. So if you attended in November or you're going to attend in December and you want specific um, topics to be covered, please um, get that information. You can uh, email me directly and I will pass the information along to the team. Uh, FY21, this is the liquidation period. Uh, we have been providing grace for catch-up of FY21 funds only, and those invoices may exceed the three-month limitation for billing. All those invoices need to be in by December 30th. Uh, this also, um, the liquidation period also includes Tier 3 school improvement funds for FY22. Um, obligations for upcoming professional development, travel, and tuition reimbursement are no longer a possibility for these funds. Next slide. Next slide, Cheryl. Oh, I did go to the next slide. Is it not? Okay, sure? sorry. Okay. Um, this is just a reminder that several types of expenses cannot be reimbursed until after the fact. The most common are um, travel, which includes your airfare, lodge, and meals registration fees. Tuition is after successful completion of the class. So what you need to keep in mind is that if you're going to obligate funds for an expense, they need to be obligated and completed. So the let's take tuition, for example. The class would need to be completed as well within the same period of performance. So you need to obligate and complete all work in the same period of performance for the grant. Just keep that in mind. I've seen a lot where um, you're obligating in one year, trying to get reimbursement in the next year and it's prior to the substantial approval date of the current year funds. Um, consultation agreements after the service has been rendered. And when considering using a specific grant to pay for a contractual agreement, keep in mind that the contract must be signed, obligated, and all work completed within the period of performance for the grant. During budget season, the business manager should communicate with the program specialist to decide which grant is available to cover budgeted costs. Next slide. 
Uh, this slide is just uh, informational. I have highlighted the funds that are now in the liquidation period and then all other funds that could be available to you at this time if you still have um, expenses for that period of performance of the grant. Next slide. Uh, Non-public schools, reimbursement for equitable services. So I have a link here to the most recent equitable services non-regulatory guidance. This is just a reminder. Uh, when is it appropriate to pay the non-public direct, directly for equitable services? Never. You should not be paying non-public entities directly. Um, Question two, may ESEA funds be used to pay stipends to private school staff who participate in services and activities funded by covered ESEA programs? The answer there is yes, but you need to pay the stipend to the private school staff. It again, cannot be paid to the private school itself. Next. Splitting invoices. Expenses can be split between two grant years if the following is true for both grant years. Of course, it always needs to be reasonable, necessary, and allocable. Uh, fall within the period of performance of both grants, right? So it needs to fall within the period of performance for both grant years that you are invoicing. Both trial balances need to be noted to explain the split. And when you are splitting salaries and benefits, it still needs to be proportional on each invoice. You can't just put all salaries, say, on FY22, and then all the benefits for the same period on FY23. Um, best practices to submit invoices for the same service period, for example, uh, you are asking for reimbursement for a service period of 4123 to 63023 against FY22, but there's not enough funds in FY22 to cover the expenses. So you're going to split the invoice with FY23, it, but it's going to be for the same service period. Two invoices, same service period, two different grants. Next. So I don't believe Andrea is with us this morning, but we do want to take this time to tell you that she does offer the MTSS office hours that take place three times a month on Tuesdays from 3.30 to 4.30. And is it's an open discussion format to bring educators together to discuss all things S MTSS. So while there is no agenda, participants will often bring problems of practice that they have an opportunity to help work through. And Andrea will share upcoming PD opportunities to be looking out for and more. So you can come to a whole office hour or you can just pop in, ask your question, get some information and pop back out. She does put the link there. If someone can pop that in the chat, that would be great. And just as a note, she she is doing MTSS office hours for the first three Tuesdays of the month, not on the fourth Tuesday of the month. And also as a reminder about professional learning calendar, there are professional learning is offered, what, what is offered through the Department of Education is it's a great resource. And uh, if you go to that website, it'll show you all the different professional learning opportunities that are happening um, for that month or for the year. And it is updated regularly um, with the latest professional development opportunities. Thank you, Monique. And then we just wanted to talk about our typical turnaround time. This isn't new, but we just wanted to put that in there as uh, people are getting into the groove of things and starting to really think about um, putting in invoices and making adjustments to their applications. Just want to remind everybody that we do strive for effective and efficient, transparent, and collaborative communication. 
We do have a, a document that's on our website that shows our best practices um, and what we're using for optimal communication between um, our team and um, in the field. Um, we do ask that you give the ESCA program manager and coordinator appropriate amount of time to respond before reaching out to another ESCA team member, um, which allow um, that allows us to maintain these best practices. We really thank you for that help with that. Um, and then we will continue to work to strengthen areas of support by utilizing the ones that are most effective and efficient so we can continue to provide you with strong customer service collectively and individually. Rita? Oh, okay. Um, we have our contact information on the slides. Ryan is out um, on a familiar way. I don't know if Cheryl can share the news with the field if you'd like to. Um, but that's our information, and it's online as well. Perfect. Thank you. And this tells you why Ryan is out. <laughs> Ryan uh, is currently spending time with his growing family as he and his wife just welcomed a new baby girl, Rory Lynn, to their family. So that is why he is out for an extended period of time. And if you do have any questions for Ryan, you can feel free to reach out to me and I will either provide you with that information or I will be able to connect you with uh, one of our program managers that can provide you with that information. So please join us in welcoming Rory Lynn to our ESCA federal programs team. <laughs> All right, so our next ESCA virtual office hours will be Tuesday, believe it or not, January 9th. We're going into 2024 at 9 a.m. So we do look forward to seeing you in the new year. And I do want to take this opportunity at this time to let you know that I am actually going to retire. I am stepping down as the ESCA Federal Programs Director. My last day here at the department will be on January 5th, 2024. I know that seems like it's rapidly approaching. I am extremely um, confident that the team is going to carry on until they're going to do just fine. They did just fine while I was out on FMLA time. And I am going to take this opportunity in my life to be able to further support my aging parents who really need my attention right now. So I look forward to still continuing to serve you until that time. And then I will turn it over to the team to continue that support until um, my chair gets filled again. And at this time, we are going to open it up to questions and support needed. I'm going to stop sharing the screen so that we can see everybody back on the screen and um, monitor any questions that were in the chat, as well as if you want to raise your hand, um, you can take yourself off mute and ask your questions. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks, Mark. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. I appreciate it very much. Hi, this is Tiffany from SU76. And I hate to ask a stupid question, but can someone explain the tidings waiver a little bit more and the carryover? I'm trying to understand enough to bring it back to the rest of the business manager and whatnot. So the as I understand it, the department got a tidings waiver and that allows us to, to keep spending down funds. But the individual district can only use a carryover waiver once every three years, and then we will not be able to carry over an excess of 15%. So say if we used it in 23 for FY23, we cannot carry over over the 15% again until FY26. Is that correct? 
Yes. Yeah, yeah. Tiffany, it's what happens is with COVID and all of these waivers, we have we've got two waivers going on. A tidings waiver is just an additional year of fund spending. So that's for FY twenty two funds. Too, not twenty for FY twenty two funds. Right. So tidings is separate from the Title One waiver. Okay, you yes. go with Title One waiver, Rita. Yeah. No, exactly. Jess is right. We apply for two different waivers and have over the last couple of years. The statute in Title I says a district should not be carrying over more than 15% in Title I um, because then you're not serving the students in that current year, in that current program. So it's much more strict than the other titles when it comes to if you're not spending it, you can lose it. We have applied for those waivers the last couple of years, so there has been no every three years. It's been every single year we've renewed our promise that our LEAs are doing their best to spend their Title I. They've had ESER funding, um, other disruptions. Um, but what we're saying now, Tiffany, is there's no guarantee that another Title I waiver can happen again. So if the US DOE says no more, please have your LEAs in Maine be spending their Title I funds, then the next time you can carry over or keep more than 15% of your Title I will be, as you mentioned, Tiffany, in FY26. And I'll let that, I want, if you have a follow up, Tiffany, if you want to clarify anything about what I just said. Okay. Yeah. I think I get it. So, um, so there's no guarantees. There's a possibility that you could apply for something again, because it seems like this has been happening. And we say that, and then again, we're like, oh, but now we can. So I see that you're, you're continuing applying for waivers. It could change, but That's currently, right. currently, if we carried it over, we're not going to be able to do that again until FY26, unless you guys get that one. That's so right. is that separate from the tidings waiver then? Yes. Yes. There's okay. two waivers happening. Okay. The tidings okay. is for all ESCA funds to extend another 12 months. Okay. And again, and that's, that's FY22, that, not FY23, which is what the okay, so one is I for. have tried on the resources page of our web website to maintain the grant life cycle visual for folks um, because right now it's current and up to date in terms of giving you the timeline. So I'm just gonna chat that to everyone again. When you look at it, you can see that FY22 obligation ends next year um, because that tidings has extended it. So now FY22 actually has the same life cycle as FY23 currently. So it does roll the boulder down the hill. It can be positive for districts and it can also mean that you're handling more funds for longer, um, which is another, not headache, but it's another thing to be thinking about. So I try to keep that, that visual up to date, at least so it's clear really when those years are over for funding. Uh, thank you, that's actually super helpful because now I understand there's two waivers that yeah. is helpful and I see what's going. I think I got it now. Thank yeah. you so much yeah. for clearing that mm -hmm. up. And if I can just chime in real quick, one other way to to think about this in a in easier terms is that with that excess carryover waiver piece for Title One, right? It, it, you're always working on that three year limitation, right? Once every three years. Essentially, what the federal waiver does for us is it resets the clock on that three years. So, right. So if you requested something this year, but we get a waiver next year, you can apply for a waiver next year and it restarts that three year clock, if that makes sense. Um, and again, but we're that's... not promising that yet. So that's Correct. why we are trying Correct. to be really clear that normally you can't be carrying over this much. We want to get to a flow where you're spending. Uh, understandably, there's been a lot of disruption, a lot of additional funding. Um, but yes, that's a good goal to set for a district is when you know you've carry over to over more than 15% in a year, be thinking that the next couple of years, you really cannot, you want to figure out how to spend those down. We might get it again. We might introduce more flexibility. There's no guarantee. Thank you, Rita. Mark? Yes, I was just wondering if somebody could go over the liquidation. Um, 
piece again. I'm not sure that I understand just what that was about. Okay, so um, the liquidation period for any grant is 90 days after the end of the grant cycle. So we just, we are closing out FY21 funds and we're in the liquidation period. So you had to obligate and spend your funds prior to 930, but you can still invoice to get reimbursement for those expenses until December 30th. Does that okay. make sense? Yes. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And Tyra, I know we were talking about sooner rather than later, because if there's an issue with the invoice or anything like that, right? So give yourself maybe two or three weeks prior to that, which I know is about right now. <laughs> sooner rather than later always is helpful. Keith, good morning. Good morning. I'm just uh, trying to build some clarity around the tuition um, uh, item that was presented. So as I understand it, um, we can obligate funds um, prior to the course being completed. Uh, with regard to seeking reimbursement, we would do that after the course has been successfully completed. Am I understanding that correctly? Correct. And that all has to take place within the period of performance for whatever grant year you're, you have budgeted those funds for. So, for instance, like FY23, you, you have somebody that's going to take a course now. You have already obligated because you've approved their tuition reimbursement voucher saying they could take the course and you would pay for it. Once it's complete and successfully completed, you can get reimbursement, but it's got to be against that FY23 grant. So in other words, like say, for instance, we're closing out FY21, right? You can't obligate that tuition reimbursement prior to 930-23 in the class be taken in November, December, whenever. Does that make sense? It's outside of the period of performance. Thinking of summer work, mm -hmm. staff were to take a course, I obligate funds for summer course, it gets done, I'm just using this as a hypothetical, uh, gets done, um, you know, end of August, mm -hmm. beginning of September. Um, should I have um, expended all of my funds from the previous year um, during that time, uh, would I then be able to obligate funds in the subsequent fiscal year should I have had substantial approval um, to be able to seek reimbursement? So with that example, um your substantial approval date is more than likely is not going to in, include the obligation date remember obligation work and reimbursement all have to take place in the same uh period of performance so like you usually have two grants running simultaneously that um the period of performance overlap Right, right now we have three, 22, 23, and 24 period of performances are, are, are overlapping, right? So that's just, that's what you have to be aware of is that otherwise than that, um, you would need to budget that in your carryover period. Okay, so that, so ultimately, um... What what is determined as the DOE's completion is at the end of the course. It is not any local requirements for submitting grades or anything like that. It was just it would just be the completion of that course. Correct. Okay. Because I mean we we can't risk uh, them signing up for a course and then quitting right or withdrawing, and we've already reimbursed for it. That's 
that's the premise behind that. Yeah, and our correct. The the only hang up that at times it, that may create is that prevent that um, employee from enrolling in another course mm -hmm. um, until we seek uh, reimbursement and that be concluded. But I get that's not the DOE's problem. <laughs> I appreciate that uh, clarification. Travis, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, I think the, the only thing I was going to add is that, um, so in, in the example we were talking about where perhaps you have fully expended prior year funds and you're solely relying on new year funding, you'll want to make sure that the earliest you have folks sign up for or that you, um, you know, have some sort of MOU with, you know, the university or something like that for that PD would be July 1st. You wouldn't want to, you know, do anything in June, because then you you kind of run afoul of uh, even potentially pre-award costs for the new year. So um, if you're talking about anything that's going to transpire over the summer and you need to, you know, get those set up sometime in June, you'd want to make sure you have carryover funds to support those costs. In the event that you don't, uh, you want to make sure that you don't obligate anything prior to July 1st, and you want to make sure that you request pre-award costs in your ESA application specifically for what those professional development activities would be. Um, so there's there's a page, I think only a handful of folks use it every year, but there's a page adjacent to your um, allocation section uh, in the EC application where you can you know specify, we need access to $5,000 of Title II funds for summer PD. Um, and if you do that, more often than not, you'll be able to backdate those Title II expenses to July 1st or whenever, you know, after July 1st, you obligated those funds. So just another piece of information in terms of structuring the application and um, making sure that you're kind of in alignment with being able to get reimbursed for those expenses. Thank you, Travis. Other questions, comments? Suggestions? Is everyone ready for holiday break? <laughs> <laughs> More than ready? <laughs> I just have one additional question and then I'll stop. Uh, I sure. just wonder if the ESEA group has had um, recent conversations with the assessment team pertaining to the issue that was presented last year uh, with getting data um, in a timely fashion so that we're able to structure future ESEA applications around goal setting. Yeah, we, we absolutely have had those conversations and we are working with the data team as well as the assessment team on shoring up those lines of communication so that we can get things out in as timely as a fashion as possible. So is there an anticipation that we would be getting data um, in in a kind of a time frame that we can establish goal setting over the summer? Um, yes. For the, okay, great. Yeah. It's great to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. One other thing I did want to mention, too, um, in relation to my upcoming retirement and in relation to, to Ryan's um, FMLA time, is that he will be returning to the office at the beginning of that week on January 2nd, and then I'll be leaving on January 5th. So I am still here in his entire time off in order to be able to support uh, his um, districts. So don't hesitate to reach out. Any other questions, comments? All right. And as we said, we will get this recording up on our website as soon as possible for future reference.